Do two of your back, yeah. I'm a back. Uh, um, are you prepared? Yeah. Okay. So we have the same triumvirat. Yes. Don Mitchell, Kapui Ato, and Lin Schnelli. Um, social justice and the sausage factory. Yes. Struggles in and over the university in the US and UK. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, you're subject to me again. Um, it should have been Kathleen, but don't feel sorry for him because he gets me in charge of the conference in Paris, right? And I may not be able to go to that one. He gets to go to Paris on our money. Um, so, don't feel sorry for him. Um, what I'm going to do is start my own timer right now because I think this is set to go long and I don't want to, so I'll just stop. Uh, so you might not get any good empirical stuff with this, but I do want to try and address the question of what kind of role universities as a space, like campuses as a space play in relationship to social justice. And before I had uh, a, a long text for my sermon, now it's two short texts. Uh, where one from a Denver student activist, you have tens of thousands of people all in one place with not a lot to do, and that tends to lend itself well to activism. It's a description of the university. More broadly, universities are under extreme pressure to become their own capitalist entities. Right? And this is the world we're all very familiar with. Many people in universities, though, even the most critical, radical, and skeptical, see universities as institutions that have a role to play constructing in constructing a more just society and promoting social justice in the city. This is not only through such mechanisms as differential tuition and the provision of scholarships to underprivileged or underrepresented students, but also through making available all, all the immense resources of the university, intellectual as well as other kinds of resources, ranging from computing power to meeting space and from efforts to organize student volunteer, volunteers to buying up vacant buildings in nearby neighborhoods to jumpstart redevelopment. Universities are positioned to promote the public good to be institutions that are public goods by, as some faculty at least hope, exposing and even promoting struggle against oppressive social struggles or, as many administrators, promote training civically minded citizens or, as many students seek to do, uh, excuse me, creating public spaces for political struggle, or finally, as most faculty, students, and even administrators still believe, perhaps against all odds, producing knowledge to advance public well-being. While this role for universities is, and even more, uh, it's even more what it should be, has long been a point of vigorous debate, itself something to be struggled over, especially as universities as institutions react to myriad pressures for more instrumentalist modes of knowledge production, sometimes linked directly to corporate patrons, and for more measurable value for money, all in the context of reduced public funding. Universities are simultaneously places where there are thousands of people who meet all in one place, with time that is relatively unstructured compared to much of society and under extreme pressure to be their own capitalist entities. So what are we to make of this? My talk today is an effort to help understand the constraints and contradictions confronting universities and their faculties and students in relation to struggles um, to advance universities as universities as forces of social justice, while also understanding that universities as institutions can simultaneously be strong forces in the production and maintenance of unjust political economies and societies. Universities' positions in contemporary capitalist society are contradictory. The corporatization of the university is proceeding at a galloping pace. This is hard to deny. But it is too simple, excuse me, um, this is hard time, but it's too simple to understand universities as only factories, sausage factories in Marx's and Neil Smith's evocative analogy, as I think the following discussion will show. Indeed, I'm going to argue that reducing universities to sausage factories is misleading and might divert attention away from the sorts of ongoing on-campus struggles that are truly shaping the role universities 
communities play in the struggle for and, in fact, against social justice in the city. So what kinds of places are universities? There is, of course, more than a grain of truth. I'm not sure if grain is the best analogy, but anyway, more of a grain of truth in Marx's equation of schools with sausage factories. It is most definitely the case that a schoolmaster is a productive laborer when, in addition to belaboring the heads of his scholars, he works like a horse to enrich the school proprietor. That the latter has laid out his capital in a teaching factory instead of a sausage factory does not alter the relation. As Neil Smith made clear nearly 15 years ago, the privatization of education at every level from kindergarten through the university was turning many a schoolmaster into a productive laborer. And though Neil did not mention uh, this, it's worth recalling that for Marx to be a productive laborer under capitalism is a curse rather than a blessing. The invention of such means of audit as the research assessment exercise in the UK, Smith did not quite say, were a means absent traditional markets for more knowledge, for much knowledge commodity production. They were means of turning specific forms of academic labor into specific capitalist abstract labor. Neil recommended, as others have, like Noel Castry, that we therefore turn our attention to struggles inside the universities, to the process of labor, and to seizing the means of academic production. Yet Neil Smith was also quite attentive to the limits of the equivalence between sausage factories and universities, and used most of his article to make a rather different argument than might be expected given how often later geographers and others have gestured only towards his acerbic sausage comments. Drawing on the now classic Bill Redding's book, The University in Ruins, Neil Smith traces the, city, the crisis of the university. It's new-ish status as a field of capital accumulation rather than only being an institution of social reproduction, the related rise of private for-profit education, and to some degree, in Neil's argument, uh, the instrumentalization of research to the university's slipping legitimacy. This is what he traces into the slipping legitimacy of universities as nation-building institutions. If the raison d'etre of the university in the nation-building era, which lasted through World War II and perhaps as late as the 1960s in European and American universities, if that rationale was to develop, instill, and to reproduce a national culture, including national preeminence in the sciences, by the early 1980s, at the latest, that rationale seemed no longer to fit. Similarly, many of the traditional ways in which universities and their polytechnical and vocational adjuncts produced and reproduced an appropriately skilled force, labor force seem to be eroding. The embrace of corporatization, privatization, and the instrumentalization of knowledge by administrators, politicians, bureaucrats, and not a few faculty members was symptomatic of the university's lost legitimacy and unclear role in the restructuring of the capitalist political economy. Becoming a field for capitalist accumulation lent the university legitimacy. If the publicly built up values stored in universities were ripe for picking, a site of accumulation by dispossession in other words, then it was not as if many in the universities, administrators, faculties, and in fact students hoping for jobs to pay off their loans were not willingly dispossessed. I've taken Neil Smith's argument a little bit further than he did. The link to accumulation by dispossession is not one that he directly made, but it surely is an implication of the argument that he did make. There are other implications or developments that ought to be considered too. The ongoing fiscal crises of the state in industrial nations have added to the erosion, probably mass wasting is a better term, of public support for education. 
the combined loss of legitimacy, that is the eroded ideological foundation of the post-nationalist university, and the mass wasting of public monetary support have combined to induce a massive restructuring of universities over the past two or three decades. This is certainly a restructuring in which university administrators and governing bodies have been complicit. But it is equally the case that administrators and trustees are simply bewildered. They have no idea what might work to shore up the legitimacy and finances under the new circumstances universities find themselves in. The past couple of decades have been a time of massive experimentation and innovation as universities have tried to reposition themselves as a new kind of public good while also positioning themselves within what they consider to be an international higher education market. A market marked by competitive competition for fee paying students research grant dollars, and direct contracts with corporations and think tanks. The result, I think, is sixfold. A, first, a push for ever rising levels of productivity from faculty members. Note the quotation marks. Um, a second, a desperate rush towards online education, now taking the rather chimerical form of massive open online courses. Third, a contradictory but sharp focus on student experience, therefore investment in gyms as well as service learning, luxurious student accommodations as well as promises of small classes. Right, we're getting both of these at my university right now. We all have to have massive online open courses and small courses. Right? Doesn't make any sense at all. Fourth, an equally contradictory turn to learning outcomes and other instrumental measures of knowledge transfer. And I think the very words knowledge transfer speak volumes about how some see the work of the university. Fifth, a related further instrumentalization of research now mandated by major funding bodies like the National Science Foundation in the United States, which now emphasizes the broader impact of research, or by auditing processes like the United Kingdom's Research Excellence Framework with its emphasis on direct and measurable impact. And sixth, the com concomitant unleashing of forces, the concomitant unleashing of forces that universities can hardly contain, such as rising levels of student unrest, focusing on costs, obviously, as student fees go up and students' freedom to learn go go down, but extending well beyond that as many now seek, many students now seek to reclaim, and not only for themselves, the public nature of the university. To refashion the university not as a public good, but for the public good, and as part of the common as opposed to the proprietary world. Through the con contradictory pressures of these six tendencies, university campuses have become highly conflictual spaces. Such dynamics have intensified in recent years, but are not at all new. Already in 1963, the great president and architect of the University of California system, Clark Kerr, argued that universities had to change into what he called multiversities, which were geared toward the production, distribution, and consumption of knowledge. I felt better as young Lee. I mean, really. <laughs> we can just change identities. It'd be a lot more fun. This thing. Uh, that's right. Production, distribution, and consumption of knowledge. Such a commodified, instrumentalist vision of knowledge would secure the university's place in the city, regional, and national economies that were themselves being restructured. Cities in particular were, be, were being remade into sites, this is all how Clark Kerr uh, envisioned this in 63, remade into sites of service rather than of industrial production. The role of the city was to efficiently reproduce knowledge workers, while the university was to be a central site of knowledge production, a sausage factory at least in part. This was a simple symbiotic relationship. The very workers being reproduced in the city would not only be producers of knowledge, but its consumers too. Such a model required, in Clark Kerr's view, the development of an extended managerial class to govern both universities and the wider knowledge economy. It required new models of management. 
Universities need to become sites for the production not only of knowledge and not only of knowledge workers, but also of knowledge managers. And all this needed measuring and monitoring. Value in the multiversity had to be calculable. Among other things, Clark Kerr was quite prescient in his prediction, as with most things, he was quite prescient in his predictions and prescriptions for the university in the post-nationalist, post-industrial society. But he was also quite realistic. He understood the limits to his own arguments and that universities, he understood, were always more than knowledge factories. At Berkeley, in fact, he built the university as more than a knowledge factory, expanding its role in the arts and as a presenter of the arts to the public, for example, developing new playing fields and other amenities for students on newly acquired property around the edges of the campus, and promoting the expansion of the university and college system in California, not only to accommodate that state's growing student age population, but also because each campus would serve as an economic economic engine in cities from San Diego in the south to Arcata in the far north. Part and parcel of this expansion was a massive expansion of and integration of the community college or junior college districts up and down the state, both as bastions of remedial and vocational education and as stepping stones into the elite UC system. These junior colleges were to be engines of class mobility. They were a bid in the context of the 1960s to make the post-nationalist university into a democratic, rather than an elite, multiversity of knowledge production and consumption. But at the same time, Clark Kerr failed to understand the competing pressures and especially the countervailing forces he was helping to unleash, both in opposition to his plans to turn the university into a factory of knowledge production, as evidenced most prominently in the free speech movement of 1964, and against his efforts to expand the university into the surrounding community, as evidenced most clearly in the People's Parks riots of 1969. In the mid-1960s, UC Berkeley sought to contain this opposition, first by banning political activity on campus altogether, that is the very same campus producing the knowledge producers and consumers of the new society, and then by confining politics to an out-of-the-way free speech zone. In particular, UC officials sought to contain protest on and near university campuses so that campuses would not become what uh, administrators called staging grounds for political forays by faculty and students into the cities and regions of which they were a part and which they were so instrumental in shaping. Clark Kerr was clear that the multiversity had to create new kinds of man and thus a new kind of citizen. This was part of its new role. But it was also had to be central force in managing and containing that man, in assuring that he was productive, that his revolts were only ever, as he put it, piecemeal. The university, thus the university sought to channel students' political passions into more productive directions. The first formalized attempts to what we now call service learning and community engagement, excluding such things as laboratory schools and settlement houses, stem from exactly this era, even if they did not take off as a phenomenon until the 1980s. Community engagement developed both as a mode of engagement within the city and as a mode of shaping and channeling political energy of creating a new kind of post-national citizen within the university. For many who work in the trenches of community engagement, such engagement is precisely the means by which students and to a lesser extent faculty can and ought to intervene in struggles for social justice in the city. When universities talk now of making or molding citizens uh, which in this post-nationalist, post-industrial age they uniformly do, such engagement programs are a central part. At the same time, however, engagement programs are becoming, and perhaps have long been, quite instrumentalized in ways not dissimilar, similar, dissimilar from the instrumentalization of research I was earlier talking about. Community engagement is understood to be a way of building resumes. Social justice work and the neoliberalization of the university are not easily disentangled. 
in the wakes, wake of the collapse of the nationalist university with its rise as a knowledge factory and knowledge shopping mall as well and concomitant with the development of citizen, its citizens molding function. Universities in more and more cities, driven in part by economic necessity and in part by ongoing search for legitimacy, these are, universities are also beginning to position themselves as what they call anchor institutions in their local political economies. While they are usually exempt from property taxes and often from other kinds of taxes too, universities are powerhouses in local and regional economies. They are, of course, large employers. And in many jurisdictions, like the one that I live in, they are among the largest. They are large consumers. They are major contractors of construction companies, office supply firms, transportation services, and the like. They frequently contract out janitorial, cafeteria, and sometimes policing work. They bring significant business to local bars and restaurants. They are investors of massive institutional wealth. They are urban development machines. They are, create business incubators, and they encourage entrepreneurialism among their students students and faculty. This is sometimes social entrepreneurialism, but quite often not. They position themselves to anchor the economy. To put all this plainly, the myriad contradictions that beset universities in contemporary global capitalism are not the same as those that beset a sausage factory. Not now and not when Clark Kerr and others were formulating the university as a new kind of post-national, post-industrial knowledge factory. Therefore, I think how we conceptualize the struggle for social justice within and from the campuses of universities, and especially how we practice it, Give, given that we live, we, us in this room, live, study, work, and agitate in these contradictions and are defined by these contradictions, has to be understood differently, perhaps than we might understand it from the shop floor. This is not to say that universities are not sites for the sorts of labor politics broadly conceived that might be instigated by sausage makers. Nor is it to say that such politics are not important. They manifestly are important on campuses where we are laborers and we labor along with all kinds of other workers, including sausage makers, or at least prep cooks, chefs, food servers, and all the others who make knowledge production physically possible. But it is to say that institutionally, universities are more than factories even now. One way to see these contradictory pressures on universities, the pressures that are reshaping universities and transforming their role in the city, as well as remaking the ways in which they are not only sausage factories, is to pay attention to two movements. The movement of students and faculty out of the university into outside communities to engage wider publics and the movement or potential movement of outside communities into the space of the campus in their efforts to engage the publics that form there and how universities seek to manage this double movement as they also manage their other shifting roles, for example, as anchor institutions. So to this end, I'm going to turn, and it'll probably be way too briefly, to up to four examples. We'll see when the bell goes off. Uh, from our research of these double movements and the campus conflicts that they call up, we'll probably end up leaving the conclusions to you. All right, so here's number one, Manchester. In mid-June 2011, we visited Salford University in Greater Manchester to talk with an official involved in various community engagement programs. Like many we had interviewed at universities in the United States and the United Kingdom, our interviewee emphasized the fact that universities could no longer be aloof from their communities. Universities had, she said, to be engaged in the social problems around them. This was vital, she told us, for the branding of the university in a competitive environment. It was also required for the safety and well-being of the students and the students that they wanted to attract. Universities in dangerous 
neighborhoods she told us were dangerous places. Universities had a moral, societal obligation to address what she called the wicked issues that confronted disadvantaged communities around them. For these reasons, among a number of others, Salford University had fairly recently developed an office to coordinate a growing number of community engagement projects involving student volunteers who, it was hoped, would thereby build their CVs and be able to demonstrate something over and above their academic achievements. I was just quoting there. Salford University was a member of the Manchester Beacon for Public Engagement, now the Manchester Beacon Network, which was established to promote service learning community engagement throughout the city. Manchester Beacon, one report reads, facilitates staff, students, and community groups to create a culture that encourages public and community engagement to become a valued part of university, everyday university life. Through the Beacon, Salford sought to move students and faculty off campus and out into the community to extend the public good of the university outwards by directly engaging its urban milieu. At the same time, our interviewee told us, universities had to open up to the communities around them. Salford, she said, is a very green campus, and we are keen to share. And there's over there, that is adjoining the campus, a public park, but hardly anybody uses it. We've got a campus development plan going on at the moment where we're making some major physical redevelopment work to improve the physical assets of the, what, that the university is. She went on. One of the things that we're going to do is improve access to the park because you go down into it and it feels a bit insecure at times. It is indeed a pretty park and Salford is a pretty campus, even as the neighborhoods all around show signs of decades of disinvestment and are now sometimes the targets of regeneration, a polite word for gentrification. Yet what struck us the most as we walked from the bus stop on the main road through the campus to learn about how Salford was engaging its local community were the innumerable signs announcing that the campus was private property. And that there was no, it's a public university by the way, there is no in, intention that any of the ground should be public, it be a public way. Similarly striking were the banners fluttering in the morning breeze. While other universities use these banners to advertise their excellence or to promote this or that top program or to show off their multiracial student body, at Salford they are devoted to reminding students that they are only a moment slip of attention away from being a victim of crime, presumably at the hands of the residents in the very nearby, very neighborhoods uh, that they are meant to be engaging with. While we were interviewing administrators, students, and others about community engagement in Manchester, students and activists were continuing their occupation of the Hetherington Building at Glasgow University. The Free Hetherington Movement was of a piece with a wide range of anti-cuts actions that had hit Britain in the wake of the coalition government's announced austerity plans. They were there were a lot of local reasons for the student occupation of the building, having to do with um, changing, shifting institutional power, and particularly the power of the budget in the university. Uh, and these are important, but I'm going to leave them aside in the interest of time. The important point is that during the occupation, Hetherington became a site for community-based political organizing, as well as a free university with lectures from local and visiting academics, workshops, and classes. Though largely free of the sort of sectarian power struggles that have marked many occupations around the United Kingdom, it was uh, not entirely comfortable space, even for those who strongly supported the movement. Some found the space quite intimidating. And of course, there was a significant opposition to its existence from some students on the campus, who more than once violently attacked the occupation. Even so, it was a largely democratic space and one quite open to the wider community. Student activists worked hard to link their struggles to others going on around town, such as fights against police brutality and against the displacement associated with the preparations of the upcoming 2014 Commonwealth Games. Hetherington became an important space of organizing for these other struggles, and some say a decisive one in some key victories, such as the Save the Accord campaign that sought to prevent the closing of a day center for adults with de developmental disabilities that was going to be destroyed to make way for a Commonwealth Games parking lot. 
Free Hetherington therefore marked a moment of direct community engagement, if not along the lines uh, that advocates for official university community engagement programs might endorse. It provided a campus space in which students, faculty, and community members met, however uncomfortably at times, and developed common campaigns and common strategies of resistance to austerity measures. The corporatization of the university and what many activists saw as related destructive efforts at community regeneration that especially impacted poor and working class communities. Interestingly, Glasgow University is alone among universities in Glasgow in not having an official university administration sponsored program of civic engagement. Nearby Glasgow Caledonian University, GCU, has made such engagement a hallmark, essential, we are told, to its brand. In order to survive, one official told us, GCU has to differentiate itself from its competitors, and GCU is doing so by developing a strong social mission focused on civic engagement that was jo joined up with a further mission of building knowledge capacity in area businesses so that they too could be more competitive. I can't tell you the number of times that uh, Muhammad Yunus was invoked in his link to GCU as he talked with people. There is and historically has been little direct student activism on the GCU campus, but there are also an impressive number of students engaged in, uh, involved in civic engagement prog programs. By contrast, at Glasgow University, which still positions itself as an elite and in many ways an aloof university, the only engagement program is a student-run and funded student volunteer services that provides a space for volunteering for students who, we were told, are not politicized like the Free Hetherington student activists were. Civic engagement at Glasgow University is not part of the brand like it is at GCU. We're only going to go two in. My crickets went off. So it's not part of the brand like it is at uh, GCU. Conversely, direct action, which draws in community activists, as at the Free Hetherington, seems less likely at GCU than at Glasgow University. Students at the latter university, Glasgow, had made the campus a space of engagement, and in doing so, actually managed to get some of the austerity agenda repealed and the public function of the university reimagined. So, everything that you were going to miss, all about Oakland, the Black Panthers, Denver, really good stuff. I'll get to the non-conclusion. Right. There it is. That's right. Both statements are true. All of us interested in the contradictory role that, of the rapidly changing, that the rapidly changing university plays in struggles for social justice need to understand how both are true. Campuses may be sausage factories, and we may be more and more the functional equivalent of sausage makers. But to say that, and especially to organize our politics solely around such an argument, is not only radically inadequate. It also risks giving up on an institution and a space that is, at least two of these stories suggest, the other two suggest it in other ways, an institution that is, I think, radically right now up for grabs. So, thank you. Uh, that was painful, but it's so close to home. Uh, <laughs> it's our life. Yeah. Uh, auto, e auto ethnography. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, I'm working at a college now instead of right. a university, but it's very much the same kind of phenomenon. Right. You know it well. It's yeah. Trinity was a leader in a lot of this. Yeah. 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 It was for a was. while. Yeah. Uh, and we still have a community learning initiative. Uh huh. Uh, but my. Uh, Friends on faculty who are uh, either you know of the left or uh, faculty of color uh, refer to it as the CLI plantation. Yeah. And um, so my question, I guess, is how do you how do you the, the contradiction is there? And so for the 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 side of it that's 
geared towards fostering social justice uh, through community engagement. Um, how, how do you suggest, if there is any such way, how do you suggest it become, uh, what's the right word? It's a long day. Yeah. Um, how does it disconnect itself? Uh, or distance itself, or somehow divorce itself from the corporatization right. and the neoliberalization of diversity. Is there any way to do that? I think one thing that we have to think about is the difference between us and our students moving out of campus and into the neighborhoods, which can be a highly, highly paternalistic move. It doesn't have to be. There, there are ways around that, right? Uh, the dis difference between that and uh, people coming onto campus and making it their space. Right, which they long campuses long have been. Right, that's one of the great things about campuses is that they open up. They can potentially be a space for uh, a different kind of politics, a different kind of community um, and uh, academic engagement than going the other direction. The difficult. We, we host the neighborhood association. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so you, know, you open up the space for that kind of stuff. You give away, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly um, using my department resources in ways that I'm not supposed to be for community organizations that have no money, right? And doing all that. So you do those kinds of things. They're pretty minor, but you, you try and do them. But universities, um, are make that, it scares the shit out of universities when you do that, right? So that's why Salford is not a public way. Right, and why they have the signs up. The other example I was going to give was the Peralta Community College District in Oakland, which is where the P Black Panthers got their start. They, like every single community college district in California now, has recently passed, within the last three years, a resolution declaring the campuses to be, this is an American term, a non-public forum. Right? That's a very specific legal term, which means that the owner of the property, the official owner of the property, which is a state agency, a state institution, so it's public, but the owner of it can allow political uh, activity on it or can ban it altogether. Right? And this is a way to establish just little free speech zones and to really limit who is on campus and how campuses are used. And this is in part a reaction to the anti-tuition uh, increase struggles that were going on in 2010. And so there's a very clear movement by, by university management to try and control that space because they know exactly how po what, what kinds of possibilities spaces like that open up. So we have to engage some of those struggles, right? We have to fight those struggles and figure out where they are and figure out where some of the openings are, right? And some of the places are and realize we'll, we'll get defeated anyway. But yeah, you fight anyway. And, uh, uh, really inspiring. Uh, uh, I just want to, because I, once I, after I heard uh, what you present, I referred to the situation here in Hong Kong. Uh, I find the situation here in Hong Kong, uh, especially in the campus, within the campus, is really a huge problem that um, most uh, university students, uh, especially my classmates, yeah, who was taught by Professor Tang, uh, they're not socially active. Mm -hmm. And then when I come back to look into why uh, they're not motivated, I find this problem so um, serious because um, in here in Hong Kong, um, many university, stu university students, um, uh, they're poor, so they receive yeah. uh, loan from the government. So once you uh, graduate, it seems you, you uh, you own government money for more than like a hundred thousand Hong Kong dollars. So um, then I find most people uh, in universities, uh, they just uh, try to make money yeah. when they're in university, so they don't concern about what's going on in society, or even they concern about society, they decide to do nothing because uh, make money is much better, right? and make money is much more important for them to survive. Yeah. And then I find the problems. Uh, and also, um, even for us, um, yeah, um, which um, we against the, like the multinational uh, or transnational uh, capitalist EFO, and we got Starbucks <laughs> during our conference. Yeah. Yeah. But and then, but it's really hard for we to find another co co another coffee shop to so it's in, in especially in campus in Hong Kong. Yeah. You have no choice. You, you only got like Pacific coffee or 
a Starbucks or even another slightly local uh, chain yeah. store um, it, within the campus. But uh, it, it, my friends in UC Berkeley, they they got um, many different kind of uh, like uh, coffee shops in small businesses, but uh, not in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, everything is like uh, governed by um, different kind of uh, companies yeah. or um, the school authorities or even the administrative staff will stop you to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I think uh, once I heard from you, I think it's really hard. Yeah, for me, I'm a bit upset because when I look back in the situation here in Hong Kong, and it's really hard for us to change anything. For example, if we, we don't serve you uh, Starbucks coffees, or then we have no choice, but we have to um, buy coffees from another chain store, which is nearby, uh, within the campus. Yeah, so, but still, nothing changed. We, we have to um, buy something from those what we call capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I didn't know how, how yeah, I haven't made up my mind the question, but I just right. got something to yeah. share. Well, uh, what, you're, what you're saying, I think, is that we live at the center of these contradictions. Right, and sometimes there are aspects of them that you can test. Sometimes there aren't. Sometimes it's not worth it, right? Sometimes, sometimes you just need a cup of coffee, and um, and so right, you know. Um, so all that's there, and and we're at the center of those contradictions, and it's, and it's figure out how you find the openings in those, right, or how you turn them, um, and which ones are important to focus on at different times, and so forth. Part of the story of the heathering, the free Hetherington movement, that you know gets elided, and when you're cutting everything down, and so forth, so it, it was a place. The the building was a graduate student union. Right? There are three unions on the University of Glasgow campus. There's the old women's union, the, the male-dominated rugby playing union, and there's a graduate union. And um, there was a whole bunch of money mismanagement that went on, apparently, in Hetherington graduate union. Uh, but a lot of people think that there was some fiddling with the books at the upper administration to try and close it down. So the university wanted that building for, for something else. And they also were getting a little bit annoyed with the organizing that was going on in it. Right, so they shut it down. They were going to rebuild his classroom space. Right, this is the same time that the it wasn't happening so much in Scotland, but you know the cuts are coming in, if not the fee increases that are happening in England. So all that's going on, and so students took it over and turned it into a new kind of organizing space, and they actually won, and they 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 won. They got a rollback of some of the cuts, particularly of language programs, right, which were going to be cut. They got those done. They got a, a new space for graduate work, right, in part because they, the administration figured they could make it less radical if they uh, had a new space for the graduate union. And all those things, but they won, right, by, by making this claim, by being very, very, I mean, it was, it was like many movements now, you know, heavily influenced by anarchist thinking and so forth and, and collaborative and, and consensual kind of decision making and, and all those sorts of things, but still there was a direction to it and an openness, right, that was, that was crucial. And they were able to do that um, as, as they were fighting through all these things. Some of it was very, very centered on the question of, you know, cuts to their own education or in the English case, and increases in tuition. And, uh, and they're able to link those, however, with larger community struggles going on and seeing the commonalities among those. Some of that was going on in Berkeley and Oakland around the same time, with big cuts to the university, big increases in, uh, in tuition fees, and cuts to all kinds of social services in the midst of the economic crisis. And they were beginning to make links there in very, very important and progressive ways. And that was crucial, too. But there was always, for many, many of the students, the same problem that you name, which is we go deeper and deeper and deeper into debt to get an education that ought to be part of being just be, because you're a member of society, right? The democrat is, democratization of the university has brought with it, right, uh, a disciplining of university students through debt. Right? Both of those have gone hand in hand, and, uh, and it's been a crucial, crucial move in parts of the normalization of society. And, uh, and so that, that dual move, dem democratizing the university and increasing debt, right, has led to uh, a highly instrumentalized notion of what education is all about. And so one of the things that was heartening about the movement, it's dissipated a bit, but I think they'll, build, they'll continue to build, and it's global in scope. One of the things that's heartening is, is reimagining the university as public, as common. Right? And that's a crucial, crucial move. And a lot of that is about debt. 
and figuring out you know, the disciplining nature of debt and, and so forth. And then the final point on that is be very, very happy that you're in Hong Kong, where the debt is 100,000 Hong Kong dollars, rather than the United States, where your debt going out would be 100,000 US dollars. <laughs> This is true. I'm, lots of the kids who graduate, right, with their English degrees, get their hundred thousand dollar. I see something from from you when I I don't know. Not this year's old wing. I don't want to be right now here. You're already on recording. Just from my personal experience, I would feel I'm more comfortable when I come back to this campus. Um, this is, the, um, uh, this is the new campus. I, I don't feel comfortable when I come here. It's everything inward and it's partition and without interactions uh, when compared to the old campus before in the other and other side. And also when you say about the university could be treated at the public. Now what we see, not only this campus and other campus, we see a lot of the security and regulate what happened in the public space. For example, I, I stay in other campus to study and then I have to be asked to show the university card. This is how they regulate um, the, the university by their own yeah. local management. I don't want to be troubled with the security because it will be the higher level of management to, to reconfigure the public space. Yeah. But what for, um, for these few years, I feel the, um, how, how I learn about, um, I continue to learn about what happened in this society, but how I can pursue, pursue the knowledge is not within the university, it's, uh, it's outside, it's in community. Nowadays, Hong Kong seems to have some side um, community, they are in trouble. Then also becoming the experiment for all different kind of the people to go to the community to have the learning instead of have the professional hierarchy. The, the professor teach us, I learn from the residents and also have that kind of relations. Mm -hmm. That I see is positive. Um, yeah, and then this is a little, a little bit ridiculous to understand the, the yeah. world of university in Hong Kong. But at the same time, outside the campus there are a lot of Oh, something happened. Yeah. Uh, that, that's right, but I think you have to think about it in dialectical relationship to divisions of labor and the importance of expert knowledge. Right? Um, one of the things we're trained in in university is very expert ways of thinking. Right? And that is valuable in a good social sense, not just valuable in the, the monetary sense. It's valuable in a good social sense, right? Because we can't all be you know, total polymaths where we know everything. So being highly skilled in particular ways of thinking right, is important socially. Uh, and so thinking about that in dialectical relationship to the kind of community-based learning you're talking about is important. I think one of the great things about universities is that sometimes we can lock ourselves away, we who are kind of activist-oriented academics can lock ourselves away and just think, right? And uh, at least there used to be room for that. And there still is, actually, and we make room for it. And, and that's a crucial societal role, it's a crucial political role, and, and it's something we have to protect. Right? That ability sometimes for some of us to be able to just remove ourselves from the hurly-burly of everyday life right, and think. Uh, because that's where ideas come from. That's where creativity comes from. Right? And so, um, so that's crucial. We have to fight the productivity kinds of um, uh, measures right, that are constantly being put down on us because that, they're, they're anti-thinking, they're anti-time for thinking. Uh, and, um, and so we have to fight those kinds of things. So we have to think about the relationship between you know, kind of the development of expert knowledges, which I think is valuable, I think it's important, and um, the kinds of community support for divisions of labor and for different, different ways of thinking and you know, community-based knowledge that is very different. It's also expert. It's a different kind of expert knowledge, right? And, and think about what those relationships are and how best to organize those relationships. I think that's the crucial challenge for us. And very, very short, yeah. uh, very short questions. Because uh, in Japan now, there's a very strong drive led by government to to become a university, the community-based learning, yeah. uh, the principal, uh, the, the very leading policy yeah. for the Ministry of Education from last year. Yeah. So the 
we call it the COC, Center of Community. Mm -hmm. the, every university raise your hand to get a fund from the yeah. university, uh, government, and uh, our university go got it, and yeah. now in the, in the middle of the doing that. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, is your today's example is uh, autonomous or self-developed uh, programs, or is it some, some related with the national education policy? Mm -hmm. the, the, like the ones I was talking about at Salford University, and so it, that's a national, partially in response to a national mandate uh, for a kind of community engagement. So these beacon things were was a pilot program set up by the coalition government. I think it's, it may it may have been the at the end of the labor. I've forgotten exactly. And there is a center for community in, uh, uh, the the a center in Bristol that organized all the beacons. There are beacons all around. Uh, England, Scotland, and Wales, and um, and they um, and so there was there was money available for that kind of stuff, and and, and uh, coalitions of universities, city-based coalitions of universities, bid for it, right? And there's actually, you know, if I'm critical of it, I don't want to be entirely critical of it because there's a lot that's really, really valuable, of course, in community engagement and service learning, and in pushing universities towards that kind of engagement, right? We're already engaged with British Petroleum. Right or Bechtel, uh, or um, in the U.S. context, the Department of Defense, the biggest funder of universities that there is. Right, so um, you know we're already engaged with them. We're already doing instrumental work for those constituents. So doing um, work directly with community organizations on community problems and that kind of stuff uh, is important. Right, it can be dangerous. Can have contradictions have problems, but it's important. So I don't want to be entirely critical of it. Right? I want us to think critically about it. I don't want to be entirely critical of it. But there are those mandates. And some of that mandate, I mean, what we need to do is take control of that mandate. Right? We've got to find those moments when, you know, when, when the accrediting agencies in our system or, or a, a central agency in, uh, in, you know, in, in Japan or in, in Britain says, you, know, you must now be community engaged. Right? We have to figure out ways to take control of that and turn it into something that's, that's politically progressive. Quick uh, question. Um, I Don't want you to, to make get a brief to connection to your uh, yeah. first presentation. Right. Oh, good, so because we need to figure out what these connections are. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, when I listen to you talking about the tuition fees and those issues, it kind of seemed to me that is quite post political, no? Yeah. Because it, uh, it, it's, right. you know, it's not something you could vote for or you could struggle for. It kind of happened. Yeah. So yeah, I, I wanted to yeah. ask you how, yeah. how that fit in your. Well, well, you know, that's, that's an in interesting point because, yes, there have been these pushes to raise fees in Britain, for example, in England, uh, and uh, England and Wales, and in, in the U.S., and it, there it's localized by system and so forth. And, and, you know, but there have long been and there always are uh, protests at the beginning, right, as those policies are being debated and being put into place. I was a community college student in 1981 when the first fee ever was put in on community colleges in the California system. And there was a picture, no, we didn't get to it, but there would have been a picture of uh, the community college that I went to. It's grown a lot since I was there. Uh, we're there, they're putting in a fee of 50 bucks, right? I am um, the son of a very, very well-paid university professor. He was an engineer at Berkeley, right? That 50 bucks did not matter that much to me and my family. It mattered a huge amount to my friends at that community college. So we fought like mad to uh, get that stopped. We lost. Right, um, and uh, but there have been times when when organizations like that have won. Right, when fees have been repealed or uh, they've been back down, or they've been slowed. Uh, you know, there are a range of things. Like that. And so I, I think there's a political fight. To the degree that there aren't fights, then the post-political has been achieved. Right, post-political -po post doesn't explain what has happened. It's what has been achieved. It's what has to be explained. How how did they win? Right, that's. Yeah, see. It seems that you know even those fights they don't yeah. get into the political arena. It's just like the local fights. Some yeah. of them win, some of them lose. But the the California fights mm -hmm. in 2009, 2010 became very much got involved in the political region, in the political realm. Uh, up in, in part because it's the whole state, right? Those uh, uh, where kids were out on the street, faculty members, and everyone else. Buildings were being taken over. It was really important. It led. Uh, relatively directly to a ballot proposition 
last year, 2012, where the people of California quite remarkably voted to increase their own taxes in a progressive way, right? Uh, so, uh, so it's a graduated tax. It gets heavier the more money you make. My brother, who makes a shitload of money, was telling me, you know, as, when I was talking, he said he's going to vote for it. He says it's going to kill me, but I'm going to vote for it because it's really important that, that we have this, so we support these kinds of things. And that those moves led to folks like my brother, who's, you know, he's. He's, he's not a lefty like me, but he's politically progressive. And, and you know, to thinking, you know, I've really got to think about what we're doing in this state, what we're doing to education, and how we're doing it, and how we're going to change it, why it's important. And I think that there's a, there's a line. It's a little bit curvy, but there's a line from the protest in 2009, 2010, to this ballot initiative that radically transformed how universities are being funded. Right and uh, and where money's coming. So now the president of the UC system doesn't say, you know, it would be crazy not to take these these five million dollars from British Petroleum and, and and set up a research institute that will do direct proprietary research for them, right? Which which he had to say in 2008. He said it would be crazy not to take that money. Yeah. I know. <laughs> question. Uh, I was coming back to uh, what family had raised and thinking about like, in, um, uh, my sort of experience about whether um, whether the city becomes, and especially for uh, you know work going on in the city, but being located in a city opens it up opens up a form of knowledge creation which is outside the university mm -hmm. and. So I was thinking of uh, Ranshir's, you know, the ignorant schoolmaster, where um, uh, there are different locations of kind of expert knowledge right. that get created. And um, even within fairly conservative departments, the fact that you have students who, uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say, um, I think it's a long day. Uh, that there are depoliticized students. I mean, I think right. uh, everyone is inherently political. Uh, and maybe the city does something which, uh, uh, when there is some form of experiential learning, you discover certain political questions which there's no way we could have done through kind of literature surveys or literature discussions. Uh, and I think in a more substantive way, I think um, there is an issue about um, systems of change within the university. I'm now thinking of my old department, DASP at, uh, at MIT, Planning, which in the 80s, um, early 80s, was involved in various politics in the Cambridge Somerville area. I mean, I'm sort of lucky to be working under a kind of crazy woman who was a hugging desires at one point and getting rich. And then, but uh, what she did is, what Lisa P.T. did was try to open up the learning space, which I think by the 90s when I came back to put in my PhD, uh, it was a bit, we had a new building and it was all box stuff and yeah. people were in glass, uh, mm -hmm. and really, really glass, uh, art glass. And I think there was a kind of a shift in the way uh, the department in the, 90s had also shifted towards creating boundaries between international development, domestic had suddenly become into environment, energy, you know. Uh, so these boxes, uh, typically the old for Peter's, Peter's, Pete Seeger song, you know, the boxes. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a point about what you're saying, I mean, at the end of the day, it's long, but I think there's a point where uh, how does expert knowledge move and where it gets created? So, how, how does it move? Where does it get created, and who has control over it? Yeah, right. That's the the other. The boundary of right. The, of, of the space gets more porous. And, yeah. You know, right. How does it get created? Who's it for? Right. And who has control over it? I think are crucial issues that we have to dis, we have to struggle with these. That was a short answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think we should reward the. Don't go water. Don't go water. <laughs> <laughs>